I always say finish strong. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're finishing strong. Um, thank you, Steve. My name is Tara. I run the email teams at Zillow. Um, B2B and B2C marketers on my team. This is one of my favorite events. Thank you to Media Posts for having me um, and to all the sponsors. I find that um, this is the best use of my time these three days um, in terms of events, uh, the access to other really smart marketers. Um, and then in addition, um, partners that we currently work with today, we have several that are here. And then also new opportunities for new partnerships. Um, so this is a great event. Um, continuing the icebreaker theme before we go too far, uh, I wanted to say not a sandwich, cat and dog, GIF, Prince, John Muir, and mine to the ladies who I will have introduce themselves and then answer all these questions. Um, what is your favorite book or author, the one that you actually feel and the one that you say when you want to seem <laughs> more credible? Um, I'm a passionate fan of Stephen King, but when I'm talking to people that I want to like have more lit cred with, I always say Margaret Atwood. Uh, yeah, Amanda, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda. Just chatted with you um, from Scott's Miracle Grow. For the book that I love, and it's, I, don't, I love it, and, and don't judge me, um, I'm in my 30s, but I, I do love Harry Potter. I grew up with Harry Potter. I love the book series. I'm not a super fan of the movies, but oh my gosh, I could read them over and over. But that's not usually what I tell people. I tell people the book Presence by Amy Cuddy. It's really interesting. It's kind of that psychological aspect of behavior, how you talk, how you sit, and how people kind of read you. So super interesting. Uh, but to go through all of the other icebreakers that have kind of been through. So hot dog is not a sandwich. Team dog, <laughs> gif. Uh, I'm a country fan, so I love Jason Aldean. And if I had to go back in history and meet somebody, it would be Frank Lloyd Wright. I was actually previously in architecture school. I wanted to be an architect, and I love him. He's my favorite architect. That's a pretty solid list. <laughs> uh, my name is Sonia Williford Gill. I am manager of CRM at 7-Eleven. I've been there for about two and a half months, um, so I'm a veteran at this point. Um, if I had to go through my list, I'll get through the list first, and then I'll answer the last question. Um, hot dog is not a sandwich. That's gross. Um, team dog, for sure. Um, GIF, not even a question, I guess. <laughs> um, favorite artist or band would be David Bowie. Um, and if I had to go back in time and could meet someone, I think it would be um, Kurt Vonnegut, who's a favorite author of mine, um, not the one I'm about to list a sec in a second, but uh, would be an amazing conversation. Uh, probably a lot of sarcasm, but a lot of learnings too. Um, as far as my favorite author or favorite books to read, um, I don't tell anybody this because like, it's everybody's answer now, following along in the fantasy theme. Um, George R.R. R. Martin, I really did enjoy reading the Game of Thrones books, but like after the series and everything else, I just don't really talk about it anymore. Um, as far as my uh, favorite author that I would tell somebody when I want lit cred, uh, Victor Villasenor, um, Marine of Gold is probably one of my favorite books. It's an immigrant story and it's beautifully told. Um, it's just an amazing story, so. Hello? There Good? Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, I know neither of those books that you just recommended, so um, I'm going to check them out. Um, I like this topic for a couple of reasons. Um, as Steve mentioned, I pitched this to him. Uh, I, it is useful therapy for us all to be in a room talking about these things. Often at our businesses or places of work, um, trying to explain why deliverability matters or why CCPA is important um, can fall on deaf or just challenged ears, I guess. Um, and so it's helpful for us to spend time in the room talking about them. But I also do like um, the ways that we can learn from each other. Um, sometimes I think there are simple innovations in what I had been thinking of as routine maintenance. Routine maintenance means a lot of things. The big topics are obviously like deliverability, compliance, um, but there's a lot of of work that, that is part of our jobs, um, the tools we use, um, uh, you know, how we, how we build a team, I guess. That's one thing I'm always asking people is how you build your team, especially if you're on the marketing side or how you partner across your, your organization to get your work done. Um, and so my goal for this conversation was basically to hear about some examples of, of what we think of as routine maintenance and what we might learn from each other, um, and then pitch the round table at the end um, where we'll be talking, going a little deeper on some of these topics too. So Amanda, you started us off really well, I think with your lessons. Um, do you wanna keep going along that story, sort of 
give us give us some more tips for for what we can do yep. to to approach this topic going forward? Absolutely. So when I ask people at my company um, what they think I do at work, they say, "Oh, you just push the send button, right? It's email. It's easy." But what they don't understand is all of the things that Tara was saying that go on in the back end to make the email machine work. Uh, without all of that stuff, like I said, we got blacklisted. If people don't get their emails in the inbox, nothing else matters. Um, so yesterday, kind of tying in, there was a really great panel called Vetting the Data, and it really talked about having a clean list so that you can be compliant. I'm going to dig a little bit more deeper into kind of having clean data, both first party and third party data, because it's not just important for compliance, but like I was talking about deliverability, um, but also personalization and your segmentation. So when thinking about first party data and how you're capturing your emails at acquisition, that's where we really start as a brand. Um, you want to acquire quality consumers into your database. Um, so at the point of acquisition, we typically use a third party email validation tool um, to validate that the emails are good and coming into our we, we don't bring them into our database unless they are valid. So what's really great about this is, so we have different points of acquisition, so we kind of have a pop-up on the website, uh, we acquire people through paid acquisition, all these different ways, um, but at the point of acquisition, there's kind of a little pop-up. If you accidentally mistype your email in, it just says, hey, this is an invalid email, um, and the person can go ahead and correct it. This really helps to prevent any spelling mistakes or just invalid emails going into your database, causing hard bounces. And then there's people who put in fake emails that aren't even real. Um, so preventing all of that is, is huge. And you can do that with just simply using an email validation tool at the point of acquisition. Also, kind of early on when you're acquiring your first party data, one thing that we like to do is actually make sure that we label each acquisition source with a name so that we're able to differentiate the different sources that are coming in and we apply that to the consumer. This really allows us to analyze the different acquisition sources um, to see what's working and what's not. And this is especially important if for paid acquisition. If you're putting money behind bringing people into your database, you want to make sure it's quality people and that you're targeting the right audiences. Um, so if you're not, we, what we do is on a monthly basis, we'll go in and actually segment those people that we brought in through paid acquisition, um, check to see what their open rates are, their click rates, and see what it is, if, it, if it's above or below benchmarks. And if it's below, we go back to the table um, for our paid acquisition strategy and make sure that we shift to who we're targeting to because we might just not be pulling in the right audience that's interested and engaged. And this is a really great opportunity to actually drive your acquisition strategy. If something's not working, don't keep doing it. Uh, do the things that are working. For us in particular, a couple years ago, we did a sweepstakes uh, with MLB, and basically we, you put your email address in and you could potentially win two tickets to an MLB game. Those people did not want to receive Scott's emails. So I got them, put them in the database. They performed terribly. They, they did not care. They unsubscribed instantly. So going forward, we don't use sweepstakes as an acquisition source because we know it doesn't work and, and people are just not interested. So first party data, when you're thinking about it, think about it at the point of acquisition. Get all of the good data, quality people in, in the first place. Um, and then kind of to reference what I was talking about with deliverability earlier, uh, list hygiene. You know, make sure that you are sending, you're, you're always checking your list, make sure you're sending to the most quality people. If there are people on the list that are not engaging with you, don't send to them. Um, and then one thing that we do, like I had mentioned, 52 week mark, we only send to those in that active period. Um, and then what's really nice about our CRM system is they kick out the hard and soft bounces automatically. So we don't have to think about that. So then shifting over to third party data, um, if anybody uses third party data to kind of enrich their first party data, um, there's kind of some tips there as well. So for us, we actually use Axiom data to enrich the people that we have coming into our database. First party data that we actually collect are email addresses and zip codes. Um, but one thing that's really great for us is we use Axiom to bring in those relevant fields that are super important to our brand. Um, so there, there's probably hundreds of fields that you can get kind of from third party vendors uh, when you're bringing in that enriched data. I think 
the key to that is bringing in what's relevant. Because there are a lot of things that you can bring in, but if you're not, it's not helping you with personalization um, in your segmentation, then it really isn't a good idea. So for us in particular, one um, piece of information we like to bring in through our third party data is if you are a brand new homeowner, you've never had a home before, for us that gives us the opportunity to segment that group and send them a different personalized content message related to um, lawn care that we would send that would be very different to our consumers that already know about lawn care, they do it year after year, um, but we can really um, present them with personalized content. Um, the other thing related to third-party data, um, again, going back to list hygiene, you need to make sure you're constantly updating it on a specific cadence. For us, when we are acquiring new users on a monthly basis, we add kind of that third-party enriched data. But then on an annual basis, we make sure we send all of our active lists back to Axiom to update all of those records. And by updating those records, you know, we know that we have the most up-to-date information about our consumers. And part of that is super important for us as a business because people move in a period of a year. Um, and zip code is a really key component to our segmentation just for lawn care because um, you know the grass type in Florida is very different than the grass type in Boston, Massachusetts. So if we promote a product in Florida, it, it's probably not the same product we would promote in, in Boston. And you can actually burn your grass. So it's super critical to have the most update to information. So so kind of going back to how critical it is to have um, clean lists and clean data in order to help you with your deliverability, personalization, and segmentation. Um, and then finally, I guess the one key takeaway that I would say for all of this, um, don't be afraid to cut your list. I think there's always this intimidation of, I have to send to everybody. You know, you get the, the whisper in the ear, your ear from leadership saying, why don't we just send all? What's the problem with that? Um, it's okay to say no, and it's okay to explain why. Um, I think people are open to understanding why, and we always say, go back and test it. You know, show that the most engaged people and um, not everybody, you're actually gonna have higher open rates than sending to all. So don't be afraid to cut your list. Um, that's kind of my one key takeaway, to make sure that you are sending personalized information and you're segmenting properly. We always say um, get more out of less with regard to that, right? Exactly. Um, um, I feel like we should talk about like future partnerships between new home buyers and teaching them how to. We should. We should. We should talk about that. Be perfect. All right. Um, opportunity. Um, I have two questions for you before we move yeah. to Sonia. Um, you had mentioned IP warming every year. Is that because mm -hmm. of the seasonality of your business? It is. And I would say it's unique to us. It's probably not unique to every brand. Um, we really don't have a lot of relevant content or products to even talk about at this time. I mean, just think if you received a Scott's Lawn Care email right now and you know, you live here in Utah, it's kind of weird. You're not thinking about lawn care right now. And honestly, you're not gonna buy somebody in your family a bag of fertilizer for Christmas. So there's really not a lot of content opportunities. So we, we don't go completely dark, but um, we kind of talk about the things that could be relevant. So that's when we rely on miracle Grow and talk about indoor growing and indoor plants. Thinking about IP warming every year makes me be like, Phew. Yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> um, and then the last one, you mentioned validation. Do you partner with someone on validation or do you have a homegrown tool? Yeah, we actually use Validity, so third-party tool. All right, shout out Validity. Yep. Um, I learned something amazing um, from Sonia, who I'm going to have introduce herself, but the thing I learned was that 7-Eleven will deliver beer to you. Totally. Yeah, so that's Not weird everywhere. And, and amazing. <laughs> but, um, but Sonia, please tell us who you are and, and what yeah, your sure. job is. So my team, um, CRM, manager CRM at 7-Eleven, my team handles all of our external communications and the two products that we kind of service, I suppose, if you want to call it that, are um, our loyalty program, which is Seven Rewards, we have an app, and then we also have a um, burgeoning delivery program, which is called Seven Now. Um, it's not everywhere, but yes, one of the big um, claims for, or claims to fame for that program is that we're able to deliver alcohol. So it's especially good if you're partying and you ran out of something to drink, you don't want anybody to go back out and get anything, um, you can actually have it delivered um, in 30 minutes or less. <laughs> um, in November, I think we were under, so it was huh. pretty good. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, so can you give us a, f a favorite example of what, what you would think of as, as routine maintenance and, and the way that you approach it? Absolutely. I like that you call it favorite example as though this is such a fun topic, yeah. right? <laughs> um, one of the things that I learned pretty quickly um, early on in my email career um, is how often we just kind of set and forget triggers. 
um, especially if we're trying to use tailored content and build those triggers out, uh, for example, onboarding content. Or um, in my past life, I worked in video games, so we had an onboarding program that was related to uh, if you purchased a new console. Um, at 7-Eleven, I've actually gotten very, I'm very fortunate to have joined early on in their CRM, bringing CRM in-house. And so as we're building out journeys and triggers and things of that nature, all of this stuff came flooding back. Because I realized, you know, as we're setting up these programs, we need to ensure that they're fairly evergreen, but if they're not going to be evergreen, that we check in on them pretty frequently. And not only for the content that's in them, but even more importantly, um, whether or not they're still doing what we anticipated they would do. Oftentimes you build an onboarding program and you're like, yes, it's done. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make everybody so comfortable with their program. We'll never have to talk to them again. Uh, and you realize that that's not, you have to check trend lines, maybe not every day, but let's look at it at least monthly and just kind of review, hey, are these onboarding programs still working? Are we seeing, you know, a change in our volume? How can we help assist with that? Are we, you know, are we still getting the right message across? Um, oftentimes, you know, for redemption tiers on um, some rewards programs, the tiers change, the items that you can redeem for change. So how do we ensure that we're keeping up with that? And <clears throat> it's not necessarily innovative. It's called a calendar, which I know has been around for a while. Uh, but we've decided that the best way to handle that is to uh, put on the calendar as a quarterly thing. It's not the most fun thing ever, but it's important that we go in and look at it. And actually, um, the presentation this morning by Yes Marketing uh, gave me a great idea, just getting that all in one centralized location. Um, right now, we're handling it with a shared, you know, shared uh, drive. That's great, but I'd rather it be something that anybody can access at any time. Um, it's simple stuff, like just making sure the dates are correct in your footer, which obviously should be handled by dynamic content, but still, stuff like that. I've been in a place not too long ago that that was not dynamic content. So every year we had to go in and say, well, it says 2015, it needs to say 2016, which is insanity. But anyway, so I think one of the biggest takeaways, I think, from, from my short career in email is that um, all of these triggers need to be checked up, you know, you check up on them, and show that they're still doing what you need them to do. Um, at, you know, pro or what is the word I'm looking for? Um, I lost a word. Performance-wise, there it is. Uh, performance wise but also make sure that they're as refreshed as possible so that the customer experience is still you know you're still giving them what you need to give them both for themselves and for your business um, you we talked a little bit yesterday about uh, reports too yes. um, and the the standardization I guess or the routine maintenance around reporting um, I think yes. there's a huge opportunity there and I thought you t you had a great example yes we um, we talked a little bit about reporting um, when I first started at 7-eleven um, it was fascinating how many reports my team was building every day. Um, there was a Monday report, a Tuesday report, a Wednesday report, and a Thursday report. Nothing on Friday, so you get Fridays off. Um, but each of those reports had a different timetable, like a, di a different set of dates. And it was interesting because day one was, you know, how did email do last week? Day two was how is CRM doing as a whole? But we want to know now from Tuesday to this Wednesday. So it was kind of silly how these things were set up. And we realized that a lot of those reports were being requested um, or had originally been requested by people who weren't even there anymore. So how do we have um, an audit, so to speak, whenever we're doing reporting, making sure that the reports that we're building are valuable because it's time, or time sensitive, but also time consuming to build out reports, especially if it's by different dates. Um, so it was really funny. I went to my director and asked, I said, you know, I don't know who else is using these reports. This one's actually named after a dude who hasn't been here in two years. So maybe <laughs> we shouldn't send that one anymore. And his, it was really funny. His response jokingly was just don't send it and see what happens. Um, so instead, we just kind of shared back on what we were producing. Um, you know, I don't need my team to be churning away trying to build a report that nobody's reading. Um, but this is, you know, we talked about it, even like automated reports that don't require a lot of time. You, somebody set them up, you know, millennia ago and they keep delivering to our inbox and we're like, what is this even? I think you mentioned something that showed up in your inbox and you're like, I don't even know how to read this data. Like, who is this for? Maybe Tara, that was you. Um, but it's funny, we don't always go back and audit. So I think my big advice for both the calendar, I mean for uh, triggers and reporting, is to go back and audit that every now and then. And it's not the most fun, but it does help um, alleviate your inbox a little bit, it helps with time, um, and it helps make sure that you're, what you're doing is streamlined so you're not doing a bunch of extra busy work that nobody's even reading. Um, you made a comment that it's not, all, it's not always the most fun, um, but one thing that put you on the spot a little bit, both of you, um, is there, a way to make some of this fun? Like, do you have an idea for how a person can work with our internal teams that at least puts a different spin on some of this work? Question for either of you. Yeah, so I think, I think we kind of chatted about this previously. Um, 
it's really hard to make it fun. It's like the routine stuff that you have to do. It's taking your car to get the oil changed. Right. Um, but we, we, we thought like, hey, why don't you just throw a pizza party? Like take the afternoon, four hours, every quarter, throw a pizza party, have some uh, prizes, you know, what we can get done, and just make it a, I guess, more of a, a group exciting thing to do. So make it something. Um, I, that's. I, mean, I advocate really for a Slurpee party, personally. Slurpee party? Yeah. Get some Slurpees delivered. <laughs> yeah. It, we, I mean, honestly, it kind of has to be a group effort. We have a very small team, so asking them to take time out to audit something is, again, yeah. asking them to do something. But the ultimate goal is to make all of our lives easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, having that conversation, I agree, just taking time out as a group to do it instead of asking one individual to do that, mm -hmm. that would be a pretty tall order. There's a reason um, the dentist gives out weird toys, I guess. <laughs> we'll have we a little there. treasure yeah. box. Here's so. your present for coming. <laughs> oh, you found a mistake, here's a treasure <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, I just blanked. I had a thought um, about making it fun. You can even take it off as like an off-site. Like, hey, we're going off site. We're going to go to add beer. Yeah, top golf and, <laughs> and golf and have some drinks and right. knock all the work out, crank yeah. it out. Uh, one thing I've learned, I think, over the years, I, when I started at Zillow, I've been at Zillow almost 10 years. <clears> so I was a team of one initially. There are 18 people on my team now. Um, and I, since I started as a team of one, many of these things fell to me exclusively in the very early days. And I think I actually carried them exclusively for too long before I realized I had a lot of partners across the org to, to share some of these, you know, it was like the burden of information, sort of, oh my God, deliverability is so hard, and IP warming is this thing that's really complicating, and I don't have anyone to talk to about it. Turns out, you do, um, and so I think that's an important uh, note just for, for people is, I don't know, the ways that we might make this fun are also the ways that people learn. Um, the way, it's the way that you're growing maybe more junior people in the organization, mm -hmm. teaching them about some of this stuff. I've pulled people in from my team that had no idea that these were actually parts of the job. Um, and so you're sort of adding value to their skill set at the same time that you're sharing the load, I think, of some of these routine maintenance ideas. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, I, I had a couple last um, notes on this, but I wanna see if there's anything else either top of mind for either of you. Um, and then I have a shout out to a special friend in the audience too. So I just wanna make sure each of you gets one more chance to. Yeah. How about um, privacy policy? Oh, yeah, privacy <laughs> policy. Um, I think one thing that we're going to dig into in, in the roundtable is, um, you know, how do you handle privacy policies? It's, you, it's mandatory. You got to send it out to your list. I mean, we all get the privacy policy updates from all of the brands. It's usually just kind of a text email with the logo. And is there a way to make that fun? Um, you know, is there a way to do that so that you know does it actually impact your deliverability too? That's a thing where. A lot of people, do they engage with those emails? Uh, what do you do about those? You know, what's your strategy? Do you kind of send it out over a really long period of time? So stuff like that that you have to do. It's not fun information that consumers want to receive, but everybody's got to have a strategy for that. They do get good open rates, though. I don't know yeah, why. Weirdly, but they do. <laughs> it's a text email. I remember coming here two years ago, and there was a, a short conversation about whether or not sending sneaky text emails was a good idea. Yeah. I don't remember where we landed. I also really like that um, sending the oops idea. Yes. <laughs> OG Chris Jenner, right? Like that was. Um, we sent out a, an email without a subject line at all once yeah. due to some AM scripting errors, and uh, it got really great open, like 20%. <laughs> and we're like, this is what? Oops. <laughs> anyway. How are we on time, Steve? Are we doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so one, one thing that, this is uh, something that we've learned at Zillow, um, sort of along the lines of, of the people that you pull in to to create, I guess, the team of people that work on this. Um, and this is where I would shout out to my colleague, Rob, Rob Hoadley. Wave your, wave your hand, please, Rob. Um, Rob will be at the round table, too, so you can come and pick his brain. Um, Rob and I came to be colleagues in email sort of accidentally. Um, he is on the engineering side. He actually worked with our Trulia team. So Zillow and Trulia are the same family of brands. Um, so we're, we're secret friends. Um, so Rob came to us from the Trulia team. Um, I was running Zillow email marketing programs. Um, I learned that Rob has extensive expertise in these topics. And so um, our partnership started sort of uh, accidentally. You know, I would pick his brain on some of this. He would help us out with things. Over, I don't know, maybe 18 months, we were able to formalize his role into what is now communications architect for the entire Zillow group company. Um, and he can talk a lot more about this in detail but he is uh, sort of our postmaster at scale, um, among many other things that Rob does for us. And so that is a thing, and this is, 
this is at scale. I'm talking this is multiple brands, B2B, B2C, and so not always the right role, um, but I encourage you to look for those opportunities. One thing that has come out of our partnership is this idea of an exceptional email event playbook. Um, we have it in development, I would say, but it's about that idea of not keeping that institutional knowledge to yourself. Um, someone might leave, someone might be, not be around for the next time that you have to warm IPs, and so how are we documenting what that process is, regardless of who works at the company, so that the next time the legal team shows up and says you have to email every single person that you can find in the database um, with this information, um, that there's a, a playbook for handling that. So that's one way that I guess, I guess it counts as innovation, um, just documenting what some of that process is across the company. That's been really helpful for us. Um, okay, I think, I think that touched on everything that we sort of had top of mind. I would open up to questions at this point. I'm sure people have more questions for Amanda given the story that she told. I had an actual like, when I saw that Spam House uh, yeah, logo on the screen. <laughs> she faced the boogeyman, y'all, yeah. <laughs> like real life. Yeah, so questions? Sure, this is Chester with Front Path. Um, question is for Amanda. Uh, I actually worked with your brand, your predecessor, so I understand the mess you inherited. Uh, we stopped working with him well before it became a mess, I think, but that's just my own ego, probably. Uh, but one thing that stands out to me when we were engaged with you guys was the challenges around the Roundup brand and marketing that. I'm wondering if you guys have figured out a way to solve that or if it really still impacts the rest of your marketing efforts in such a negative way as it used to. Yeah, so I can't talk too much about it just due to privacy stuff, but um, I will say every brand in our core brands does have its challenges. And kind of like what I was talking about earlier, when we have one brand that is, is having issues, since we're all on the same domain, it does impact the rest. So um, with that, without going into too much detail, we have talked about breaking up that shared domain because certain brands have had issues um, with marketing to them. We've even considered, you know, I mean, some of the brands that we market to, like Tomcat, Roundup in particular, it's weed, weed control. Tomcat is uh, rodent control. You know, should we even be sending emails or should we be thinking of other ways uh, to market to people because we don't have a lot of people on those lists and part of it is like, do you really want to receive emails about rodent control? So, um, but it's kind of one of those things that, you know, we get asked by leadership, keep doing this, keep doing this. Um, so we've kind of started to consider, since it's very diff it's a very different group of people than like Scott's and miracle Grow, of actually taking them off of our shared domain and having them on their own domain. It then run it runs into all the IP warming issues, but if one brand is really having a struggle um, with kind of deliverability because of things going on, um, it allows them to kind of stay in their own lane and doesn't impact anybody else. So good question. Uh, back here. Uh, Walter with Message Gears. Um, I'm afraid, Amanda, this is another one for you. Um, I was thinking through that one million unengaged users data lake story that you told and the struggles that you went through with Spam House. Um, did you think through or were there any kind of re-engagement strategies outside of email that you tested to try to get those one million to kind of reactivate with you guys or? Um, at the time, I would say I was brand new to the company. I kind of relied on all of the information everybody was telling me and I didn't know a lot about deliverability at the time. I really had never had uh, a coworker or colleague that could mentor me in that kind of fashion. Um, so I didn't really think through that, but of course, looking back, there was an opportunity to really take those lists and segment them down to very, very small groups and sending to those um, at the same time that we're sending to the already existing consumers to see how they are engaging compared to the existing. There was also an opportunity, I mean, I've been talking this whole time about using validity to validate our consumers. We should have put all of those million into uh, the validity uh, platform to see how many were actually still valid emails because we had a significant number that were hard bounces. And um, what I found out later, um, and nobody was really able to tell me on the team, you know, where these all came from, but it sounded like they could have came from, they've been floating for eight, 
eight to 10 years they could have been in there. It was really unknown because there actually wasn't a time stamp on them. Um, so yeah, totally messed that up, you know, all on me, but they're definitely, now I know. It's one of those things where you had to learn the hard way <laughs> of how to do it, and I will never do it again. I'm also, I'm very, very careful about who we bring into the database and making sure it's quality people, and I validate all of the emails before I bring them in now. So very good question. We've actually turned that into an interview question in certain instances, like, oh, tell us about like an email, you know, miss or mistake, because you're right, like everyone has them, and those are some of our deepest lessons, I think, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, th that's how we earn our stripes a little yep. bit in this yep. industry. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna continue this in the round table. Tara, thanks again for bringing this great idea to us. Thanks, everyone. And, uh, and thank you, panel. Thanks. thanks.